Welcome to the Occult Rejects. Uh, as you can tell with the title and the name, you already know what time it is. Uh, we got more of the Process Church, and uh, if you're anything like me, you can always go for more of the Process Church. Uh, it's like uh, the gift that keeps on giving. It just like never stops giving you stuff to talk about and be shocked about. And just like a spider web of just you know, connecting so many different things. So uh, for me, I never get tired of listening about it. And especially whenever Dana's presenting it, and, and JJ himself, since they're both presenting stuff. Because uh, it's normally, um, it's not like the same shit regurgitated over and over again. They're actually coming on and bringing on something new. So it's always interesting for me. It's always like the process story time. So uh, <laughs> today, as you know, I already got, uh, we got uh, Lisa with us. What is up, Lisa? Thank you very much. Um, would you like to let everybody know where they can find your stuff if they don't already know who you are? Sure. JJ Vance, Sets of Operation GCD, right there on the screen. Uh, Nick, Lisa, looking appreciate the invite back. Looking forward to the conversation. Dana, always always great to share some process details with you. So uh, absolutely looking forward to the conversation today. So got a lot of great process, uh, you know, like you said, new thoughts in the process and some new information slash old information that seemingly has been lost throughout uh, the history of uh people talking about this subject you know folks like ed sanders who had really broke some ground years ago that uh you know people are still kind of disputing some of those points and in, in some of that ground today and then a lot of his stuff it seems to be of loss to the uh time and conspiracy culture here mm-hmm. but yeah definitely looking forward to the conversation a lot, a lot of good oh, stuff yeah. here i think oh, today yeah. oh yeah and you know like when i said before about like uh you know like new stuff it's like i feel like a lot of um this is a good way to explain it. You're going to love this one. Right, Dana? <laughs> I feel like a lot of channels that cover the process church or a lot of other groups that cover the process church. It's almost like listening to Manny Grossman talk about the son of Sam. It's nothing new. <laughs> it's the same shit regurgitated over and over again. <laughs> and you always well, get like, I heard this from someone, but I can't tell you. And I can't show right. you the documents yeah. either. You know? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's always exciting to have you both on. And uh, now go ahead, Dana. I'll let everybody know uh, where they can find your work. Uh, Rotting Jewels on YouTube and Instagram and Dana Duda on Twitter. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'm sure everybody's links are in there already. If they're not, I will definitely add it after the fact, but definitely check out their stuff. And if you're new and you really dig uh, the process church, definitely go check out Dana's stuff. Uh, Unfortunately, you don't do podcasts still, right? You're just on uh, pretty much Twitter and YouTube, correct? Dana. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've gotten invites and stuff, but I've been so busy going back and forth. No, I'm saying like you don't have but... audio. Like you just do, you just release no. video, right? Okay, yeah. All no, right. You I'm really have... risking it out here. Yeah. I'm free balling it, you know, <laughs> but it's fine. All right, awesome. Uh, yeah, and if uh, you happen to be new and you're really big into that type of stuff, and especially Smiley Face Killers, go check out JJ Vance's channel. Some great work on that stuff. I always like to promote it. Uh, all right, so... It. I'll shut up now, and I'll let you guys uh, do what you do. And uh, I don't know, um, maybe Dana, we'll have you go first. And uh, I know you said you did have some interesting stuff this morning. I don't know if you want to start on that since it's kind of fresh in your in your head. What are you talking about from uh, this morning? Oh, I think you said I thought you said like this morning somebody confirmed like something about like this the, that wedding or whatever. Oh, yes. Yeah, and okay. it's like if maybe so... you want to get into that a little bit, I figured since it was kind of new for you, you know. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I've made, I think, two trips to the Ed Sanders archive at Princeton. Um, Obviously, there is, I mean, there's seriously, I think, over 300 boxes of his research still there. And I feel like I got a lot, but I really only made a dent into it. Um, What Nick is referencing is an interview with a former member. His name is Joshua Sunchild. So he worked for the Berkeley Tribune, and he wrote a really interesting piece about the process uh, where he got the secretary to basically admit that they're just trying to brainwash everybody, and they are fascist and Nazis. They don't see a difference in between, uh, and they're just trying to uh, purport the most extreme version of both to the point where it's indifferentiable. Um, 
However, he named someone in the very beginning of the interview. Now, here's my problem with this tomfoolery with the process, because this is where I think a lot of the smoke is as far as the spy games and the conspiracy theory stuff. I took pictures of that whole thing. Uh, the first page, somebody cut it with scissors. So it's cut off like after the first two sentences. And then there's 14 pages that are missing from that interview. But the first name that you see is him talking about, oh, oh yeah, this guy's a super whiz in Scientology. And uh, his name is Jack Horner. So if you go on the McClary's blog, they have their huge entry about the uh, Carr family from the Son of Sam. And in there, she's talking about Jack Horner um, and all the weird, like, uh, drugs and guns and all that stuff that they were doing as far as, like, L. Ron Hubbard and his boats. But apparently this Jack Horner individual was at Hubbard's wedding party in Tangier, which is just really bizarre. Uh, so, I mean, I think that there's some heavy-hitting names here. I think that Scientology is kind of the golden goose that nobody's willing to talk about. Uh, and, you know, case in point, Ed Sanders had this little newspaper clipping and it was about Scientology getting this book taken off of the shelves. The book was called Satan's Slaves. Uh, someone that I know in the UK has gotten that original copy because it's extremely rare, but that book I thought was referencing the motorcycle gang, the Satan slaves. It wasn't. It's actually very heavily discussing Manson, Scientology, the process. Oh, but wow. for whatever reason, the church went after that author and not Ed Sanders. Obviously, the process went after Ed. So there's a lot there. There's a lot to be uncovered. That story, the entire timeline, uh, no, the case isn't closed on it, even though, you know, there's a Netflix documentary coming out in a couple months that says otherwise. So. Oh, it's like soap opera shit right here. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> oh, no, it's just like drama, right? like, and just like weird, you know, just like anything crazy that can happen probably. Will. You know, this yeah. person taking care of that person. Um, What's the deal with um the motorcycle gang? Maybe you just had mentioned that. I didn't know that there was like a motorcycle gang involved in this. Oh, yeah. There was I a mean, few of them. So the main one was the Gypsy Jokers. And well, that know. is the group and the member of the church, Victor Wilde, a.k.a. Brother Eli. So in the court records, that's the guy that they're really trying to distance themselves from because, you know, he was pretty high up in the motorcycle gang. And the church says that, you know, he was just this really low ranking member. That's not true because I got the full uh, acolytes, initiates, uh, messengers, disciples, the full list. That dude was a high ranking member of the church. Um, but these gangs, because when you go on the Manson blog, that really old blog, there's really short police files that give a really condensed version from one of the informants, Leslie Buffard, and there's a little bit about Victor Wilde. But I got the full transcripts of both interviews. They're both like 70 pages. And these gangs, you know, reportedly uh, were, you know, being, you know, paid to do these hits. Uh, what the hits were for in particular, it doesn't really say. Uh, you know, Victor Wilde, you know, praises the process, doesn't really have too much negative to say, but he also seems to be very well versed in Scientology uh, and the inner workings of Scientology, as well as Mormonism, which I think is really obscure, just considering the time, because it's not like he has access to, you know, the internet or anything like that. Um, so, I mean, as far as what they were doing, I don't know. I mean, we have a specific number of what John Phillips was funding the process. There's multiple reports in there uh, that he was giving them. I think it was a total of like $25,000 within a matter of a year and a half to two years. I think that's a pretty, you know, big chunk of change for back in the day. Uh, especially for a group that, you know, he's not really involved in. And as far as, you know, the motorcycle gangs in particular, I think it's interesting. Uh, there are reports that in Taos, New Mexico, uh, apparently uh, the process was hanging out with Dennis Hopper. Uh, at his ranch in Taos, New Mexico. So we've got, you know, the whole like uh, Easy Rider, Dennis Hopper, John Phillips, the mamas and the papas, and bringing it into the son of Sam, something that I think is really interesting that kind of brings it full circle is 
in Ed's files, he has like a timeline of everything. And apparently Bill Menser was involved in this place called, I think it's the Magical Island. And it's some like weird occult spoopy club, whatever. But apparently he was hanging out with Mama Cass and he wrote for this club. And he like wrote some article about helping her lose weight. So like... Was he Manson too? I don't really know, but he was obviously hanging out with these people going pretty far back, not even counting like the Roy Raiden stuff, right? Dennis Hopper. He was also in uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Apocalypse Now. Yep. Those are some yeah. interesting films to be in considering this, this <laughs> yeah. crowd too. This yeah, Hollywood crowd, like, they all stick together it seems. And I was like, wow, Texas yeah, Chainsaw Massacre, isn't that amazing? Yeah, he, he's in that Bob Evans mafia finance kind of early start to his career, his career in Hollywood. Hopper, like the rest of them, they have Bob Evans to thank, you know, for for getting their start. He took a lot of these guys from the uh, stables of a fellow named Roger Corman, and Roger Corman has a lot of financing that get, that coincides with the mafia families that are involved in. In some of this, some of these shenanigans, you know, these, these occult shenanigans. It, it, it's interesting. I was going to say something, and then I forgot. And then you said mafia, and it kind of reminds me a little bit about what I was going to say. You know, these bike, these bike gangs. Uh, I often think that, like, almost very much, kind of like how I was explaining or how I was trying to explain the Lions Club and the Rotary Club with the Smiley Face Killers series. Sure, I feel like they're just like hired hands or henchmen, or like they just get like. Maybe some of these like money donations is actually going and paying the people that are involved with that to carry out sure. crimes or move things. Yeah. So we need a couple of kilos moved. We need some bodies moved. We need anything. I mean, those most you know, if you were to watch, I guess like you know things on biker gangs. I mean, you know, who knows how legit these interviews or these documentaries are? But like, I mean, it seems like all of them are pretty much like if you got the money, we'll we'll fucking move or do whatever you need. You know, they'll yeah, exactly, yeah, no. They handle logistics. Yeah, Sometimes yeah, they're really, exactly. The wet work. You're totally right. They know how to travel. Yeah. They know how to move shit. Yep. And the thing is, too, when you got 50 of them, like, unless they're breaking the law, do you really want to fucking make a scene and pull all these guys over? Right. Unless, like, you know, know for a fact. Call like, another state or another city <laughs> yeah. to make a hit on somebody. Because time and time again, that's what these that's what these biker gangs surrounding these this topic of the Son of Sam or Manson, either one, that's what these biker gangs are doing is these, you know, drugs, guns, and, and people. You know, yeah. disposing of people and trafficking people. Yeah. So. But yeah, the, one of the lead informants in Ed Sanders' work, and you know, a lot of the son of Sam, surrounding the son of Sam stuff was a guy who was allegedly the uh, vice president of a biker gang who was the security for the son of Sam cult. And I think that's from what I look at, Victor Wild and and his uh, his folks out there in the in surrounding the Manson the Manson saga. You know, it seems like his biker gang was doing a lot of that same kind of security and logistics as well. So it seems like different times and different coasts that these, these biker gangs are serving the same function to the cult, to the process. Yeah. Yeah. That's my thought with uh, the Lions Club and the Rotary Club in some ways too. And, and if you think about it with Easy Rider and Dennis Hopper, you got yeah, Jack Nicholson, really Peter Fonda. I mean, it's kind of, they're, they're, that's kind of, they're, they're promoting this, this biker outlaws lifestyle. He's got, he's got a serial killer and a, uh, and a, a, a bike basically. With right. The, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Easy White, Easy Rider. That's funny. I forgot about that one. Yeah, and I believe Didn't it was Grand Cheesy. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Grand no, yeah. Cheesy Finance, Texas Chainsaw, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's the um, that's the no longer in the mob uh, who just went to visit David Berkowitz and interviewed him for a two part series uh, in prison recently. He says he's not in the mafia anymore, but he, then he says that you only leave the mafia with a toe tag or you go into witness protection. And I said, oh, so you're letting us know that you didn't leave the mafia. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> Why they're allowing mobsters into a prison to interview David Berkowitz? Don't know. Who knows? Yeah, and he's an no, interesting character relative fun. to Hollywood activities in general. But yeah, his father financed Texas Chainsaw Massacre. His father also financed the 1972 uh, kind of like, you know, classic or you know infamous porno flick um deep throat that's and that right. was that was premiered right. that was premiered at a process owned porno theater in hollywood so these people all seem to continue to, to travel in the same circles if you have years later this franchisee character who was a, he was a capo in the um colombo crime family and and i would actually assert was 
somewhat, um, you know, involved in a lot of Hollywood activities, managing within that family like his father seemed to have been before him once his father went to prison in the late 70s because Michael Franchisi also went to prison in the early 80s when he was producing a different Hollywood film. It was largely uh, you know, a lot of dancing, a lot of cocaine, starred Sammy Davis Jr. However, when the, the feds came and arrested him off the set, Franchisi that is, you know, they, uh, the final cut of the film uh, included uh, no parts of Sammy Davis Jr. So the star of Franchisi's version of the film was all left on the editing room floor. That's what a cocaine nightmare this this movie was apparently, you know, cocaine-fueled nightmare this movie was apparently about. But So Franchisi's got connections directly into, you know, the, the Rosemary's Baby, you know, Bob Evans uh, stable of, of actors there with, uh, with Sammy Davis Jr. And then, you know, obviously the cocaine stuff that was going on around that film. I mean, it's the same kind of characteristics that that's, that uh, all of these characters find themselves engrossed in. You know, it seems over time, you know, this is the pattern that seems to replicate itself. And the mob angle, you know, is certainly, I think, one that's often, you know, undiscovered and under, you know, you know, mm. not so much really looked into when you're discussing these cult activities. But I, I think see they're them involved as being too. The same yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's interesting when you were when we were talking about uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, yeah, right. you know, and, and Dennis uh, Dennis Hopper because he was he was in the second one, yeah. Yeah, right, the second one, yep. Uh, I was thinking about that, and it made me remember this guy, Joe something, I think that was his name. It was somebody I had covered a long time ago where, uh, interesting enough, he was tied to the mafia too, so it's like, what the fuck? Um, is there something up with the mafia and eating people? But, like, this guy was, like, knocking off hookers and turning them into hamburgers and selling them on the side of the street. And I was like, oh. that kind of reminds me of, like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, they were sure. putting people into, like, sausage and beet. You know, they were selling it on the barbecue. Barbecue, there's yeah. you know, and I was like, you know, you got this dude who was associated with the mafia, kind of doing the same thing, and uh, I don't know, <laughs> just no, it was kind yeah. of modeled after Ed Gain, wasn't it? Yeah, the yeah, yeah. So that's what they playing. said. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. No, 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 that's fine. I, mean, I often wonder though, like you know, there was like that was so these financing these pornography films, these horror films at the beginning of the seventies, like. This was a, this was a creation of a new genre genres of film like the, these cults, uh, you know the the cult the cultists involved the mafia folks involved, they're all perpetrating these ideas into society at that time. I mean these things really did not exist prior to that. So I think that's one thing I always focus on when I'm, whenever I'm looking at this this subject matter, you know specifically in this era and some of these films that they were producing, like these kind of what would be considered you know disturbing ideals to to purvey into society you know, drugs, sex, and murder, you know what I mean? Eating folks, you know, that kind of thing. These things weren't in the, you know, public mindset prior to these films really being, you know, widespread, right. you know, concepts that perpetrated by the films. I mean, in, in, in sequels, I mean, how many Texas Chainsaw Massacres and remakes have, have been produced? Where I, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect that the Colombo crime family and the Franchisi family specifically may be putting those in their pockets still to this day with uh, some royalty rights relative to remakes and uh, and sequels. So I well, just that's, think that... That's an interesting... Sorry, go ahead. JD. You know, I just think this helps their criminal enterprise, right? It's perpetrating these kind of ideas in society, you know? Well, I, I do think, like, you know, this has just been my opinion. I've said it a few times. I still think that, like, Italy and Germany might be, like, still, like, mind-fucking uh, the United States uh, magically in, in occultism. And I, <clears throat> I do think that, like, even... The mafia here, I have sometimes wondered, is like almost like kind of like an extension of Gladio, but like in the United States, you know, because like if we didn't have serial killers, we had the mafia out in the streets, like, you know, terrorizing people. Sure. You know, too, that, that could scare people in, in a sense. And, you know, but whatever, I have wondered about that. But it's like, you know, they uh, even through like movies, I mean, they're going to influence. I mean. Put it this way, I mean, not that I, I'm not getting political, but, like, only, like, we have Robert De Niro yesterday calling people gangsters, and it's like, if it wasn't for domestic terrorism, you'd have no career. Because, like, literally, that's all you've done is play people that are gangsters that literally came here from another country, commit crimes, and send the money back home. Exactly, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what the fuck, man? Like, you know, and we've accepted that and think it's cool, but it's, like, kind of really fucked up. When you, when you get older, you start to realize, like, you know, because of shit constantly falling off the truck, that's why um, prices are going up, too. You know, fuck, man. 
Yeah, always some criminal <laughs> enterprise. Yeah, make, that'll make some. That'll really cause some inflation, right? Yeah, some I really inflation. actually, I could really care less until you start like selling drugs, and now you got kids robbing their grandmothers to buy coke off of you. You know, like yeah. that's like the shitty shit. But uh, you know, yeah, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> No, I mean, no, I think that is a good point as far as the influence because... Oh, yeah, they have a huge they influence in movies like, and like thinking. It's, cool. like, it's a cool thing to do or a cool thing to, like, cool lifestyle or, you know, the, the, the whole concept that Hollywood has perpetrated with these films from, you know, The Godfather to Goodfellas, et cetera. You know, De Niro, De Niro's been in all of these, right? I mean, he's kind of a character, common character in any kind of mobster film over the years. But, yeah, I mean... This has caused people to like think that these. That I think I think it's caused folks to, in the general public, to look at these movies and think it's some sort of like caricature. You know, like it's cool to consider these people as like, uh, you know, the anti-hero, right? Like kind of the anti-hero concept. You know, they were kind of early onset of the anti-hero in Hollywood is perpetrating these mob figures as heroes, right? To, you know, to some to somehow emulate these people and they're in their Joe Pesci. Yeah, he's another guy that's in like every every mob film. But you know, I think in doing so, they've created this 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 atmosphere where folks consider the mob as something of the past. You know, it's something that you know. One thing that I feel like is often a statement's often made by you know different throughout all aspects of society is folks claiming like New York City would, was run better under the mob or Vegas was run better under the mob. You know, those are things I. I've heard repeated in recent years from various parties. Is it, I mean, were they really run better? You know, I mean, because then you're recognizing there was all this crime, like rampant crime. Like, I just don't think those were honest statements. I mean, regardless of how horribly cities are run today. But, you know, I think Hollywood has done a great job at making folks think that the mafia is cool. The mafia is a thing of the past, you know, and it's not really something that, that goes on today. And, yeah, I think that's done on purpose. To your point, JJ, about Hollywood kind of inserting thoughts into the the societal zeitgeist and then um, Nick talking about Germany and um, Italy, you said, that um, you have Lookout Mountain just down the road from Laurel Canyon and you have all of these Hollywood people that are extremely influential in Hollywood with their movies and stuff like that just down the road from Lookout Mountain. And you look Mm -hmm. at what the Lookout Mountain operations were happening at the time, what was being funded at the time, it was all media propaganda. And so you have to, you have to assume that that's exactly what was happening. I think in my, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But that's probably a captain obvious statement, but that's just, (laughs) no, there's people that don't really know. know Yeah. What was that, Dana? No, I said there's people that don't even know what Lookout Mountain is. No, I- no yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we really don't know what was ever filmed there. It's not like a complete like list of activities that went on there. You know, like it's right. still kind of mysterious, even though it's people. Some people know what it is, right? Yeah, but when you see the people that come in and out of Lookout Mountain Air Force Base that were frequenting that area, like Carson was Johnny Carson was one. Sure. You 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 start to say, okay, well, you know what everything he said at night that went into people's <laughs> TV rooms you know, was being inserted into the zeitgeist even back then. Sure. So, mm-hmm. Ronald Reagan was another one. Yes, he was. And he has connections into the cold activities of California, not the only governor, but one of the governors that have connections yeah. into these, these California cold activities. Yeah. It almost makes you wonder if he was installed for that purpose. I, I think his predecessor was Jerry Brown, for sure. Yes. I do too. Jerry Moonbeam Brown from Laurel Canyon, Laurel mm-hmm. Canyon fame. I believe he dated Linda Ronstadt for years. Oh, that's right. And according to uh, the notes and files of Ed Sanders, he certainly seems like Ed Ed considered him to be a a uh, part- you know participant in the uh, process and you know creepy California cult business. That's interesting. Hmm. So did Immigration Services because that reports from Immigration. That's from yeah. INS. They were really, him and Maury were digging really hard into that angle, and they made it very clear that uh, there was a lot of gay processing and activity with Jerry Brown. Yeah. So. As the Pope would put it, there's a lot of faggotry going on. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Over on Lookout Mountain. It's to, it was it was pre-Broke Rack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I'm so laughing that the Pope said that shit. I was yeah. dying. But I mean, so like Jerry Brown, I think is an interesting character. You know, he was very much part of that Laurel Canyon scene. 
you know, integrated dating some of the musicians and stuff like that. Very, had a lifelong friendship, or I believe still does, allegedly, with Linda Ronstadt. Um, he, uh, he's, you know, was he was in charge of, the, you know, of, uh, various. I, I think I think a lot can be said about a lot of investigations that transpired, even in the the Manson case or the subsequent cases there that were, you know, process related there with the. Uh, you know the Manson family and, and Victor Wilde and these some of these other outlying characters that aren't that clearly played an important role in the Manson tale, but didn't aren't really uh, often talked about as much today as some of the other some of the other aspects. But I think an important thing to consider in those investigations is there's clearly pressure from the top that's deterring these investigations, that's causing the investigations to end or certain investigations to focus on certain things. I think it's characters like Ronald Reagan, who was the governor, followed by then Jerry Brown, who was the governor that, you know, in the 70s, this is the 60s, late 60s and through the 70s. I think it's, these are important things to consider as far as those, how those activities went down. That they had, you know, allegedly had top cover as far as getting away with these activities. The same can be said for the Son of Sam case with, uh, according to Maury Terry's notes, there was numerous parties within the political political crowd of uh, Westchester County and New York City, generally speaking, including allegedly the son of the mayor. So if you're looking for the NYPD to get deterred from their investigation, a lot of folks like to blame detectives and everything else like that. When you look at the, uh, my opinion, look at the executive office of, of the, of the city of the, of, you know, situation, the, the president, you know, calls the shots for the federal government and the you know, governors of the state, the, the city, that's the mayor in a city like New York city. That mayor controls a lot, has a lot of weight, has a lot of power. And if his son's involved in the cult, well, by all means, I don't think anyone's going to be investigating that anytime ever. Right. You know, and that's why it would, it would also provide context for why investigations in the 90s would get shut down with an NYPD as well. So I think that's an important part is considering that some of these politicians, even as high up as the California governor, may be involved and may, may in fact have been members of these cult, of these uh, the process cult. Yeah, I mean, you also have to think too, like with these cults. I mean, there's kids born into these things. I mean, they could Absolutely. be they could be groomed for like hoping, like we got to get somebody into politics or so, making it easier for us. I'm glad you said that. That's actually, in my opinion, has <laughs> gone on in California in recent years with folks like Chase Boudin, who was the district attorney for San Francisco. He was the child of uh, two members of the Weather Underground. His parents were members of the Weather Underground. They went to prison. He got raised by two other members of the Weather Underground, the leaders, Bill Ayers and Bernadette Dorn. Who, uh, there's a lot of crossover, in my opinion, with those with crowds. Obama. And, well, Obama, yeah, the, yeah. And, and those crowds back at the same time frame with the process. Mm -hmm. with The, the mm -hmm. Weather Underground grew out of the students of Democratic Society, and there's a lot of crossover with those organizations. And, again, they function the same. So they function as domestic mm -hmm. terrorist organizations, creating chaos, bombing places, murdering folks. So you can call them by a different name, but I just, I describe by their activities and I call them all the process. And they kind of have like an all encompassing type program in that they fund you know, in terms of their grooming of who they groom, they basically fund their education. So, you know, they kind of, you know, are indebted as soon as they come out, kind of like with, with Obama. Sure. And so then now you have this entire, you know, class of people that you funded and now they've gone on to become, you know, huge in terms of the political office. And then if you need someone to cover up whatever, they're already installed. Absolutely. You know, I think that's yeah. an important fa factor in these cults and how they continue to exist is mm -hmm. folks are born into them and groomed into positions. And again, how does the, right. the son of a weather underground, you know, basically the uh, the poster child of the weather underground become the district attorney of a, of a city like San Francisco? Right. Makes you wonder, right? Like, how much control these cults still have today to be able to install a character like that. Granted, he got thrown out of office because he was doing a lot of weather underground activities and letting foment in chaos. But, you know, it uh, still makes you wonder how he got there in the first place. You know what I think is a good example of uh, even like what we're talking about, the Mormons in Utah? Sure. I mean, not saying that every one of them that calls himself a Mormon is of like the actual practicing and cult-minded, but... Uh, I mean, they've definitely set themselves up, I think, purposely, some of them, with uh, being in the government. Definitely does them favors. Oh, for sure. Well, yeah, you're dealing with a, more of a theocracy there, right? Like, you can't be in political power in any position in Utah without being a Mormon, I don't believe. Like, 
You're not going to be the attorney general, the governor, you know what I mean? Like the senators, all the, all the major positions, you you kind of have to be a Mormon. But that's like when me, when me and uh, Lux, when we covered Skinwalker Ranch, that's why I was like, you know, like that's so convenient because it's like you have Mormon people associated with the ranch. And then as you go up politically, you do too. So it's like, you know, here's a nice little freeway to just kind of get what we want every once in a while. Yeah, didn't they even have the attorney general on there for a while? The one that's in all the hot water oh, right now, yeah. Reyes? You yeah, like, yo, he was on, on the show. Yeah, 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 it was so stupid. <laughs> yeah, Fugle had to go talk to him and debrief him. Yeah. Ask him. It's silly. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good way to, that's a good example of how some of the, like a very similar cult can, you know, may operate. And when I say similar, similar in theologies, it's ancient alien cargo cult theology cults, um, you know, between the process or the Mormons, you know, they both have these alien belief systems. They, uh, you know, or Scientology, you know, the, these cults, they all, they all kind of do have the same mode of operations, you know, as far as who they're going to put in power and, and stuff like that. So you do it for the Mormons are obviously putting people in power in a more overt manner. Yeah, I think these other cults are doing the same thing. They're trying to put people in power to make decisions beneficial to their, their ends, right? Whether it's, uh, their ends as far as the publicly facing, you know, aspect of their church or religion or their ends as far as the criminal activities that, these cults engage in you know and you know what it drove me nuts when we covered them and i i really do think he probably is a descent is like even bigelow you know he had owned that property at one point and that name does go back i think to where like not uh not uh, not joseph smith bring him uh, bring him young or whatever i think yep. he eventually ended might have ended up having a, a wife a, a one of many with the last name of bigelow like that's how far back it goes but like you know that does uh, that name does go back to Mormon, uh, you know heritage, and I mean that guy's got fucking shit in out of sp- supposedly out of space and on the space <laughs> station. You know what I'm saying? Right. And like at one point, if you went on his site when we were covering him, if you went on his site for fifty two million dollars, he would, could send you to Mars for ninety days. That's a deal. So I mean, like you even have somebody who supposedly has got this technology using Elon Musk's <laughs> rockets to send you to Mars for ninety days. Right. Oh, that's right. He does use Musk rockets. That's right. The fucking it's government. Because they never get off the ground, which is odd. <laughs> Isn't that though? Yeah. The but um. That could be at least one. Mormon adjacent, right? Like at minimum. I, I I agree with you. I don't know the exact genealogy, but that is a Mormon family, and uh, and it's like everybody tight with Harry Reid. Everybody else before him and after him, like you can confirm, were Mormons. So that's why it's just like were you the one and only one? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah. And he would, and he wouldn't have any of that business. He'd still be in the hotel business, I believe, if it weren't for Harry Reid, who was a Mormon, the U.S. senator from Nevada. Yo, even the hotel business, I'm sure that's some shady shit. <laughs> yeah, I hate to right. say it, I'm sorry. I mean, that's even like after like oh, things I started, been, right? I started seeing with like the Lions Club instead of like having like a, a lodge they were meeting at like a Best Western or something like that. And it's nice. like you know how convenient would that be? Like if the person who owned the place was also kind of like into shady shit. You know, always in the, always in that always in that order. You know, you just you start to I, think I like this. A lot of that goes on, quite honestly. I mean, especially yeah, like those like fucking seedy ones you see off like the side of highways, like Kings Inn and shit like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, oh, I wanted to go back to. Uh, fuck! I totally forgot. Now I'm so sorry. I had a brain fart. I was going to ask Dana something. Something that she had said earlier that I wanted to ask, but I can't remember now. Uh, I'll ask something. All right, go for it. Yeah, please. Um, please. Let's talk about profit. Let's talk about Melissa Profit. Oh, boy. This is coming out of nowhere. So, <laughs> Sorry. yeah, so this was, <laughs> no, it's fine. This is just like a random little, like, I don't know, rabbit hole that I had went in. So, obviously, uh, you know, putting things into context, there's been a massive Son of Sand disinformation campaign, right? And they completely ignore... Oh. I mean, in my opinion, the stuff with Roy Radin, the stuff with Bob Evans, uh, the stuff with Adnan Khashoggi, the Scientology thing is always missing, whether it's Whitney Webb's book, whether it's, you know, the new Son of Sam information that's coming out, that's always missing. So I was looking and trying to see just how Bob Evans and Adnan Khashoggi met, and it was a woman named Melissa Prophet who... uh, her good friendship with both of these gentlemen, she was able to broker the deal for the Cotton Club. So when you look into her, 
uh, you know, she had said in multiple interviews that she was very close with Adnan Khashoggi specifically. She was seen, uh, me and Lisa were talking about it earlier, with his son, I believe his name was Mohammed, uh, seen on his plane with him traveling for years. But she specifically says that, like, her and Adnan were tight, and she was very tight with Bob Evans. Uh, the most recent interview that I read said that she didn't care that the deal ended up falling through with Adnan and Bob Evans. She just wanted co-producer status on that film with Bob Evans. Like she basically admitted to setting it up to fail because she just wanted to get that in and be able to co-produce the movie. Uh, but her dad was a famous like Las Vegas performer who was a protege of Frank Sinatra. Uh, it's all just a lot of Iran Contra stuff and, that Scientology angle because one of Adnan's wives was a Scientologist. I think that that's something's missing. Yeah, with Frank Sinatra, you know, it's funny because the the association with Johnny Prophet because of him being his pro protege or so to speak, Frank Sinatra, I believe, was um, a target of like many extortion attempts by the FBI. And from what I understood, he was so scared of the mafia at, one, at some point that he was supposed to quote unquote sing for the CIA or that they had gotten him on the take to help them out, so to speak. So he was, he was heavily involved with in and out of intelligence guys, whether on purpose, whether because he had to, he was still, it was still well known. And I believe there's a whole lot of files on Frank Sinatra, um, FBI files and CIA files on him. Oh yeah. Yeah. He was tight. He was tight with, for example, uh, Johnny Roselli. The out of Chicago contingent of the family of the mob, their mob mob contingent of Chicago, and Roselli, uh, I believe, uh, committed suicide the day before, a couple days before he was supposed to testify to the House Select Committee on Assassinations in the seventies. So yeah, Sinatra was deeply ingrained with all that kind of JFK CIA nonsense, and the FBI had does yeah has an extensive file on the guy. He was definitely uh, deeply uh, mobbed up since his early days in Newark. It wasn't. Uh, you know, long before he was out in Vegas, you know. Yeah. But back then, like, I mean, to, I mean somewhat to his, I guess, to his, uh, you know, to his credit, I guess, if you want to call it that. But if you want to be a, a singer, you know, back then, uh, Frank Sinatra, you know, as he's growing up in New York City, everything else, all those lounges are run by the mob, you know. If you want to get employed by these places, it's all, you know, very much mob, mobbed up. So to a certain extent, he obviously got involved with the mob there but if you i mean a simple look at any of his record within the fbi or cia files that are that are public i mean the guy was had an extensive life in the mob so yeah i wouldn't be surprised if he's there's a lot of dark stuff in that guy's life that's never really been public just given his his associations and again associations with the cult stuff right like he's deeply associated with cult stuff and it's often not considered when you think of frank sinatra you don't think oh Lots of cold stuff, but like he's into some yeah, weird stuff, was. you know. He was, he was yeah. very much into that. Well, uh, I would argue that the mafia is occultism because yeah, that Michael Franchisi really guy talks about like how he got a made man and he did some weird blood ritual on Halloween. Yep. I'm like, that's literally occultism. Yeah, no, like, I really do think it's different. I do think somewhere at the top there's occultists running the mafia. I mean, it just it's just so too much the same, mm -hmm. in my opinion. You know, and again, like, even, like, my experience with, like, orders, um, and then, like, you know, you'll take advantage of the people who don't know the truth. So that's why you have these people, like, these henchmen or these you know, foot shoulders, soldiers getting pimped out, doing dumb shit for money. Mm -hmm. Because they don't know, like, what the fuck's really going on, and this is, you know, have at it. <laughs> you're disposable. You're, you know, you're ignorant to what the truth is. You know, you're going in the complete opposite direction. That's like a free slave. Sure. Yeah. And if you have these Italians being associated with the mob and then being in, into occultism, then you have the Germans, Nazism, who was heavily into the occult. So now you have two <laughs> That's groups. That's why I said Germany and Italy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> heavily, you know, being the puppet master. Who's to say the mafia is really what it is to begin with? We only know what it is because the TV told us. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Think about it's that. Very true. Because of all, all these movies with Robert De Niro. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, and Joe Pesci. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's for sure. And again, these people are financing not just regular films. They're financing pornography films. They're financing 
horror films. They're financing every sort of film. And I say these people, the mafia. And again, it's the same characters that, uh, so, uh, Franchise's boss, Michael Franchise, the guy that recently, re- like, uh, recently released his interview with David Berkowitz, but he actually filmed that interview like eight or nine months ago, at least seven months ago. And just recently, recently released it. So I think that's kind of weird why the guy sat on the interview for so long. Not sure what why he would do that if he wants to promote his wine or whatever else he's promoting in that video, or you know threatening David Berkowitz because it seems to me like that video was kind of like a sit down, you know, an, a sit down if you will, like a mafia sit down, like sitting down telling the other person like this is how it is and this is how it's going to go, kind of deal. And I'm just you know I, I know Dana's pointed out before with relative to that franchise interview with Berkowitz, these guys seem like they have wandering bishop type qualities to them, both the Christian ministers that are. They're there visiting Berkowitz, so I think that's something to consider as well relative to the, the pattern of behavior throughout all these other cult activities relative to the process. Because the process obviously has a Christian contingent, right? They have a wing of the process that is dedicated to Jesus Christ, despite some of the uh, interviews that Victor Wilde gave in the Ed Sanders files, where they, they seem to at certain times try to convince folks otherwise. But in their preve- their actual documents, they do have four gods, and one of those is Jesus. So you would have to have people that are Christian in appearance and, right. you know, folks that have these wandering bishop vibes that, mm-hmm. that want to go have weird conversations with David Berkowitz. I would, I would say those folks would be, <laughs> those folks would be, uh, you know, s- suspicious. I'm, I'm at least very suspicious of those activities given uh, the fact that the process never, never ended according to even members of the process today. Like for example, a uh, member of the band we we spoke about before here on previous uh, shows, Skinny Puppy, a member of that band has actually done interviews in recent years on podcasts saying that he's the he's the middle person in between the pro, the old process and the new process, and he, he also makes a statement saying that some process chapters never closed. For example, the Albany chapter of the process never closed; they just kept going, according to this guy. And again, he's the self Albany, New York. Mediator, yeah, Albany, New York, right? Always, always New York. <laughs> but again, that's something we've also discussed in recent recent shows: is how other cults that have operated out of Albany have a seemingly have a very similar stranglehold as the you know what I imply the process did with folks like Jerry Brown, but Nexium had that kind of uh, you know involvement with the New York politics, and they were headquartered out of Albany. And uh, you know, I'm not saying that there's a crossover between the Nexium cult in the process chapter that apparently never closed in Albany, but I wouldn't be surprised since they're professing some of the same theologies that there is a crossover between those organizations. And again, it would just be another example of how the process has control over high political offices to help, you know, continue their criminal activities. That's what, again, history has, has shown. You know, there's you know there's a reason why Nexium got away with for, with things for so long is because they were, and to to a large degree, they still have political top cover. They still exist as a, as a cult. In fact, they recently just put their headquarters up for sale in Albany, New York, the home that they operated their headquarters out of. So this cult never went away. And again, they still have members within the New York government that are at least at minimum connected to the cult through direct family members, the U.S. Senator Kristen uh, Gil, uh, Gilbrand. Her father was the PR guy for the cult and a member of the cult, and her, his wife, which is her first cousin, I believe. The guy, I think the man married his, his niece. I think is how it went down. She's also a member of the cult. So you know, there's you know, that's just one example of political power connections still within places like Albany, New York, that has a, pro- a process chapter that never closed down. Apparently, that is wild. It sucks. It's that's uh, so far away from me. Yeah, that's interesting. But I mean, I think it kind of go, you know on that same note, you know these these bands that we had previously discussed, you use the use the the process. They have the process theology as their as the you know the philosophy of their album. You know, give it Skinny Puppy for example, right? And they use the you know uh, other other. You know, these are the same people that use the smiley face symbol as a chaos symbol. Um, so I think you know, I yeah, I I think these you know I quite honestly think there's there's more to these sort these narratives and storylines with these these different bands and stuff and this this philosophy of the process that has, has permeated at least the industrial rock, you know, um, music scene. But also I think there's a lot to be said when these people are making comments, again, a member of skinny puppy who has an album, the process 
they're using some symbols that that uh, you know we've discussed. You know, again, the the whole smiley face symbol symbolism, everything else like that. And then the same individuals making comments like the process never ended, and they're this they're an integral member in the process. I just think these things shouldn't be ignored when we're you know the greater confirmations of, of things we've already discussed in previous shows relative to these same you know these same narratives. You know, I think there just seems to be more and more evidence of the same things and. In statements made by these individuals that they're proclaiming these things themselves. So it's not like I'm really inferring much when I'm just simply trying to, you know, bolster these statements that they've already made. Big mound country. Yeah, that and I correct. mean, uh, Fred Gianelli, uh, he Fred. was process adjacent. Uh, I would say a process aid in my personal opinion, due to my experience with him. But, you know, there was some weird stuff going on in William Sims Bainbridge, uh, his Facebook group, Process Alpha. Uh, but specifically, you know, there were people chiming in when Fred's handler, in my opinion, got uh, yanking his chain about talking about me and going back and forth with me, where, you know, this person has kids, they're adults now, but they work at Best Friends. And you can see, like, on Facebook, on Twitter, they're engaging with, like, high-ranking staff at Best Friends. And that person said specifically, you know, Fred asked them, you know, are you a part of the old process or the neo process so the guy was like it doesn't matter and i'm like oh so there is a neo process we finally have a confirmation of that i mean so i would say that best friends is absolutely i don't think it's allegedly anymore i think we're way past that at this point as far as the alleged i think that there's plenty of circumstantial uh and documentation you know what i'm saying because something interesting because you know pretty much all of the founders when they die we don't have obituaries a lot of them we don't have any official death records you just have what they put on the best friends website right um a couple of them it's just like one report in a local paper that you know they died in a car accident but in ed's files i had never seen these and never heard of these it's their original incorporation papers from new orleans and it straight up sounds like secret society mason and vatican like all mashed into one uh, a lot of really weird language and they said that any time that one of the founders dies they have to come from all four corners of the americas back to new orleans it's interesting because when the hurricane was going on and Best Friends was there, that was right around the time that Marianne de Grimston allegedly died. We have no proof of when she died, but I just think that that's really interesting because they were all there. You know, I have on that note, a side note, I have, um, a, there was a law enforcement, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, I won't say his name, that was helping us take us back and forth between the um, islands off of uh, Mississippi. And he talked about the hurricane and he literally said, and I quote, if you were ever wanting to fake your death and evade, that was the time to do it. He says, because they found so many different body parts and they couldn't identify them. There were so many refrigerated trucks with different body parts and no one could identify that many. Wow. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if she did, that would be the time to do it. I don't That's know that. Wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, it just it would make sense if they're like sowing chaos. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I don't think that they're there helping anybody. No, I don't no, believe no. that at all. I don't think no. that they were in Haiti with the Clinton Foundation helping no. anybody. You know, no, I, these people are you know serving their own ends. But it's just interesting that they have like a very sort of like Vatican Masonic framework with all of this weird language that's not in any of their publications, any of their, you know, inner teachings, nothing. And it just happens to be that they're back in New Orleans at the time that Marianne allegedly died. I just think it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that document, their initial corporation documents, you know, they're, they're done by Tommy Baumler of the uh, JFK assassination infamy. The uh, lawyer that worked out of uh, at former FBI Guy Bannister's office worked along with folks like Carrie Thornley, who Carrie Thornley and, and actually in, uh, ended up incorporating the process into the JFK Jim Garrison investigation by making claims relative to uh, <laughs> relative to um, you know some some of the activities of the process at the time. So then when the process came into New Orleans, that's at the same time Garrison is doing the JFK investigation. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of crossover right there, but I think this incorporation document and the fact that they have to, you know, it, it speaks to it. It's like, almost like it's a Vatican city. Like if 
where the Vatican City serves as the global headquarters for the Catholic Church. It seems like New Orleans so yeah. serves as the uh, the headquarters for the Process Church, and uh, I think that's often overlooked. I think when people consider the and have conver- the same old conversations of the Process, they're like, "Well, they came into America and, and set up incorporated in New Orleans, et cetera, et cetera." But mm-hmm. I would argue that they've never left New Orleans. They still operate there today, according to these incorporation documents that are their current incorporation documents. As you know, that, that they, um, you know, they didn't actually even remove anything, any language from their their later incorporation documents and, and uh, later states. Any, they, they still read of uh, not the same language, but of a cult church language, all the way up until the early two thousands before they finally removed some of that language. So. But they're still operating under the same corporate structure as these documents. It, strangely enough, at least that legally speaking, they, that's what they claim to be, at least. But, but um, strangely enough, none of the activities that are really described in, in these documents are really you can you really see, as Dana was pointing out, they're very strange, strange hierarchy and, and structure. It doesn't, they don't seem to be following like they call. For example, they, they don't seem to be following these these uh, incorporation documents really with the, within the structure that they've outlined. For example, they call chapters is the commonly referred to terminology for their for their individual cells or whatever you know different cities they have chapters. According to these documents, they call them abbeys and uh, priories. Which Crowley had an abbey. Abbey of Thelema. I was going to say speaks to what's well, the other language. It's it's Templar language. That's. The Templar, the Knights Templar, called their stuff priories and abbeys. I believe that language in the incorporation documents comes from Crowley. It comes from the OTO, I believe. That's some of the influence oh, that that they have. And didn't Crowley take most of the stuff from Catholic Russian Orthodox? Yeah, yeah. So I think that, highly, that could be some of the influence. Highly that, influenced by the Russian Orthodox yeah. at times. And New Orleans is heavily influenced by the Vatican. That's what I remember passing through New Orleans. They're very, oh, yeah, very Catholic, Catholic centric. Stuff. Yeah. I still do think a lot of stories Crowley told was just he might have maybe understood some deeply occulted Catholicism and rebranded the story and inserted himself into it. Sure. I really do think he's done that. Well, he got he got along well with the Vatican, right? I mean, he seemed to get along well with the Vatican. They seemed to be okay with one another. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and, I mean, listen, if they're into anything like wanting to understand stuff, I mean... You'd be stupid for you not to, to actually just as a benefit and possibly one day. Why not have somebody that may actually be an occult genius? You know, you got to keep them close to you just so you can use them. I can see the Vatican doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if they're both into the same thing, uh, occultism and all that shit, I could see why you would, if you can tolerate the person and they haven't already heard you shit talk them, you might have some sort of like, a, <laughs> you know, friendship <laughs> or benefit sure. relationship there. Well, I mean, I think, I think relative to New Orleans, that's a good point because, I mean, as far as the Catholic influence goes, because as far as any other U.S. city goes, that, I mean, I know, like, you think of, like, Irish Catholics in, like, Boston or Irish Catholics in, like, New York Notre City. Dame. Yeah, Notre Dame. But, like, none of those other places have parishes as, as their yeah. governmental structure. Right? Well, I remember France was heavily Catholic. Absolutely. And when yeah. Napoleon came and took that area, and, of course, he could maintain it because of yellow fever, but it, it, it stayed. That whole yep. influence stayed, and you know, to your point about Crowley and the Catholic Church, Crowley to me, what to the to the Vatican was like the telescope Lucifer in Arizona to the Catholic Church. It's mm-hmm. their it's their cue in or their key in to outside of the realm that they you know worship currently. Sure. Oh, you know what? Lunatic Jones just mentioned Abbey Road too. Abbey Road, yep. That's Abbey. Right. And he did have Crowley on uh, Magical Mystery Tour, right? Mm-hmm. Interesting. That's a good. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. So even my hacks like yo Abby sounds like Crowley, hundred <laughs> percent. I don't know. That's it's really interesting. I'll have to look into that. But yeah, well, I, I, I definitely yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a Templar thing that he he probably borrowed from you know because the OTO the order was that order of the Eastern Templar. Is that what that is? Ordo Templi Orientis. But it, it yeah yeah oh, yeah yes yes. Yeah, to the order of the Eastern Templar. Yes, or something something like that. Yes, yeah. They even like they. I've even said with their um, degrees, they acknowledge uh, the Illuminati. I think the Knights Templar, 
and the Rosicrucians, I think, all like, I could be wrong, but at least two out of those three, they do, uh, for sure, the Illuminati, because I find that funny. They're like kind of add-ons or like extra like, you know, names as you're going through that. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. when, you're in, when you're at a certain degree, that might be other things that you could get into to kind of like be specific or maybe like a certain, um, you might take like a certain job or something that maybe gets you a title or you studied something specific or you've had whatever specific experiences. And I do find it interesting that like he does like acknowledge those, you know, I do find that interesting. Or there must be something legitimate to it, you know. Regardless yeah. if it's like the real one, I'm assuming he's at least acknowledging that, like, in my opinion, you're not going to throw a name like that onto people. Or you're not going to take that. Once you get that high up, unless it's, like, serious and you understand why you're using that name or accepting that title. Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't understand. Like, I would, must be something behind it. I've even yeah, wondered if the OTO is a Rosicrucian order and just not, you know, oh. and just not public about it. Well, that'd be interesting. I really do think it is. I just, I was just a wild guess, and especially just because of stuff that, uh, that Lisa's even like seen in his writings. Like he is obsessed with Rose, but like it's like you know, either it's the Rose or it's his girl or is it this or that? Or sometimes I've wondered. Like, yeah. I've, in my opinion, I've seen him kind of be influenced and rip off. Rosicrucians are people that I was into Rosicrucianism. So then I wonder, like, are you dropping that rose constantly to let people understand what's up? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, in his handwritten notes, he has rose capitalized, like if it was a name within the the actual writing. And it it doesn't seem like it's a it's a noun being used in the sentence. It seems like it's more of, you know, something different. But yes, it's purposefully purposefully capitalized. And when he released um the vision and the voice he had they have an edited copy where he went in hand edited whatever and he specifically picks specific words that needed to be capitalized but not all those words were capitalized in the edits it was just specific ones on specific pages at specific times hmm. yeah so you know it was coded yes yeah right there, seems right there, yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, there's even, like, things that uh, we've seen covering ciphers where sometimes, like, uh, that could be a sign of it, like, the capital letter or, like, sometimes, like, uh, now, like, you'd be so, like, questionable. Like, you'd be like, okay, that's probably there for a reason. Sometimes, like, you draw, like, a little character to kind of let you know, like, something stopped and something's beginning. So, like, those capital letters are probably something along those lines, I would think. I would think so, too. Interesting. Yeah. All right, enough about that. We kind of got off on, got off on that. <laughs> well, speaking of Rome and the, and the Vatican and whatnot, the process is still pretty prominent in Rome today. Is it? Oh, well, that's I mean, right. That's, a, did you they tell? They have an active museum there with some some of the original process stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You sent that to me when I think when I just left there. I think didn't yeah, I even well, say that? I was like, fuck, I just left Rome. I remember. Well, I saw you post some pictures of Rome. Like, you know what? There's a process museum there, isn't there? I should send that to Nick. <laughs> Yo, and the thing is, is like, that in even if I'm like, fuck, I'm not near it. It's like, oh, that's like 30 minutes on the subway the most, maybe. You know, yeah. so like I could have, damn, if I would have seen that earlier, I may have actually made that happen just to be like, fucking you probably, probably could have got in there with the, uh, even if I couldn't you know, the, get in, I would have filmed the front of it. Yeah, too, or something to be like, I'm going to call this, you know what I mean? I'm with you guys, see? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got a cat at home. <laughs> <laughs> Oh shoot! Oh yeah. No, but there, there's numerous pictures of founders and other other old members of the of the original members of the process that go over that, to that museum in recent years, and young folks in like their 20s from America that are pictured in that museum as well. So it seems to be a a popular spot amongst these this uh, the circle of process folks to this day. That's yeah. It's I feel to Rome of all places. Right, it makes you wonder because they I used to have a just... chapter in Rome, right? Right, Dana, they had a chapter there, but they allegedly, according to their documents, they claimed to have left. Yeah, I mean, they shut it down five days after Cielo Drive. So, oh wow, is it related? I think it is absolutely. <laughs> uh, I think that it's absolutely related because, according to the IRS, Robert de Grimston was in Rome at the same time that uh, Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski and Rudy Altabelli were there. Why was the IRS keeping track of that? You know what I mean? Unless there was some weirdness going on. I mean, at this point, I really don't think it's 
anything that anybody thinks. I think that this is a lot weirder than anybody I thinks. Think I'm wondering if like Roman and Robert knew each other, you know, it's oh, who can I'm really sure. say it's just, there's, there's so much that has not been uncovered and it's, you know, just the idea that it is what it is. I mean, these people have done a fantastic job. I would say that their propaganda is, they almost surpass Scientology. It's just kind of peeling it back. You know what I mean? But I mean, they are Scientology. I, I hope that like, my goal is to get everybody on board with quit calling them like Scientology. They are Scientology. They're like the muscle of Scientology. You know, whether you want to call it like dark Scientology, whatever. Because people love to talk about like the occult origins, the spoopy origins of Scientology, right? And it's like, no, no, no. That's what the process is. The process successfully did that, right? Like, there is those weird things. They don't want to talk about the intelligent stuff. But that's what the process is. And they've been very successful at it. It's, uh, yeah, Absolutely. I've got a long way to go. Something else I do want to touch on really quick before you pull up that slide is as far as Victor Wilde and the motorcycle gangs. So the last time that I talked to you guys about him... So, you know, I had found that his leather business in the newspapers, it looked like it had started to boom. Ed Sanders had one of Victor's magazines, and it's a very nice magazine. When you open it up, literally it opens the first sentence, as it is, and then uh, the last sentence is, uh, what is it, as it is, so be it. I think that's like what they say, the process, like terminology, whatever. And then he has all these designs that he's promoting for that year, and... Just saying, Ed Sanders had an entire transcript that I have where he was working on the Zodiac stuff. Some of that stuff kind, you know, that the whole Zodiac thing, I don't know anything about it, right? But I know that the dudes, people were seeing weird masks, right? And one of them was apparently, you know, a very well-detailed, well-crafted leather mask, right? And I'm working on a map to show where all of the victims are, where all of the process people are, where the Manson family is, where the Height ashbury Medical Clinic, including the separate amphetamine lab where they're doing that research, the Church of Satan, all the like well-known parties within the Church of Satan, Esalon, because Esalon's right there too. You know, it's all, I think that Ed was onto something with the Zodiac and multiple police departments in different jurisdictions agreed with him. They think that the Zodiac is tied to Son of Sam and Manson too. And they think that it's the process that's involved, you know, but Ed said himself in one of the letters to a former detective that he stopped writing the book because he got spooked. That's what, that was what he said. He was like, I got spooked. I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and that's why he donated his stuff to a university. So I just think that people need to be willing to like reconsider like all of those crimes. Cause it's really stupid that the Zodiac basically mimics the son of Sam. Right. And in the son of Sam, we have Jimmy Breslin who's, you know, uh, the dog made me do it. Right. Like he's the one in the newspaper communicating with David Berkowitz. But then when you go to Ed Sanders files, I find files that Jimmy Breslin was actually in the pantry when RFK was assassinated. He was one person that helped to subdue Sirhan Sirhan. And then, you know, the stuff with Zodiac, you have Melvin Belli kind of doing the exact same thing that Jimmy Breslin did with David Berkowitz. I mean, they literally mirror each other. It's very bizarre. And I think it's weird that people don't talk about Jimmy Breslin seemingly being present in all of these strange places. Like people talk about him with like Malcolm X, right? But they, I haven't seen anything where they talk about him and RFK and him being in the pantry. I think that that's super sus. That was, you reminded me uh, of what I wanted to ask before you brought it up, Esalon. I was going to ask because I have, uh, is a, uh, going to be a couple, not me, but I have people that are going to be coming on to cover Esalon and Synanon. And I was wondering if there was like maybe a connection to uh, the process at all. Of course Esalon. there is. Yeah. Especially <laughs> Synanon. Yeah, really? absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to figure out like all of Esalon's cutouts because in California, like in oh, the hate... Lot. Uh, for the people that want to get real particular about me pronouncing things, hate in the hate, uh, Esalon was using the, what was it? I think it was the first Unitarian church. That was their major cutout. So at that time, that's where they were running a lot of stuff out of. They've got like John C. Lilly, 
literally every single week, basically like holding church at the First Unitarian Church. John C. Lilly? The the dolphin guy, yeah. Oh. They do a lot of... Who's friends with Timothy Wiley. Oh, yeah. my God. So I would God. argue he was a process, again, in my personal guy. opinion. <laughs> they, do, they do a lot of lectures currently with really fringe people. Um, what's his name? The, the guy that... The guy that wrote a book, we just, we covered it. Um, Aubrey Marcus's book. He wrote a forward on the guy that constantly gives lectures at Esalen. Oh. Well, uh, Processi and Mitch Horowitz of the Temple of Psychic Youth. He also is a Esalen uh, alumni as well. I just yeah. found that out recently. So, I mean, yeah, there's absolutely there's cross lot. pollination, but the synod on history is pretty complicated. So, you think I'm when he showed up, to see what you guys come up with. You think yeah. when Lily showed up, the dudes were like, "Yo, did he bring that chick with him?" Like, you know, that one's good to go. That's horrible. <laughs> You're shot out, dude. <laughs> They're like, yeah, fuck it. You didn't bring him, man. Fuck. <laughs> Those guys are in there for how for long? They're thirsty, you know? They're like, oh, she's definite go. She's jerking off dolphins. <laughs> oh, they were doing a lot more than that, man. That whole story is really, really dark. I just. It's really dark. I don't. Oh. It's almost like, was she like mind fucked or was she just really that shot out? It all this made sense to her. So like, like, how do you even like, you know what I'm saying? Like, how do, how do you go on a tangent? How do you get there? Like, how do you end up like you're in this situation and you're like, wow, this is me. Right. Like, how do you get to that right. point? <laughs> it wasn't it that she was getting him to do psychological experiments and he wouldn't do it unless she did it. Well, so initially, I think the reason why, like, they bonded, like, her and the dolphin, the argument that they give, is, like, she painted her face, like, kind of, like, a light gray, and then did black lipstick oh, so that it looked like that. the dolphin's oh. blowhole, and so, like, she was, like, pretending to commute. There's videos of this where, like, she's, like, pretending to talk to the dolphin. It's really uncomfortable to watch, but then I guess, like, Lily had this entire house built, and it had all these, like, traps doors to let water flood through the house and so they would do it slowly like very very slowly they would dress her up in a leopard or tiger print bikini the dolphin would be in this like really shallow like glass aquarium that is the dolphin can barely fit and then as soon as the house filled up like they would let the dolphin go and they would you know uh consummate i don't know who's perpetrating the crime on who there i have no idea but uh yeah, that was that she bonded with the dolphin. Oh, like there was definitely argument. bonding. There yeah, well, definitely yeah, there was more bonding. than bonding, yeah. but I guess the uh, like not blackface uh, doing the blowhole impression, I guess that gave some sort of emotional tie. Oh it's God. really dark. I don't want to talk yeah, about yeah. it anymore. Go Sorry. ahead. <laughs> Wasn't Polanski uh, trying to do a film about this in around the time of the Tate the Tate murders? He sure was. It was the day of the dolphin that he was researching yeah. with Wojciech Frankowski. That's yeah. right. Yeah, how strange. Mm-hmm. I'm glad to see someone in the chat had no idea about that Lily story. That's great. <laughs> That's great. I feel better now. It's a real hellscape. <laughs> I covered I mean, that in MK I mean, Ultra, and I did not know there was videos. I'm so upset. I missed the chance of presenting those. <laughs> it's, it's it's an interesting thought, though, of this guy's tele- trying to telepathically speak to dolphins, and he's doing all these processing activities because, you know, I think uh, – I like, that's Animal one, one, of my, one of my more no- noted theories in life relative to the process is uh, that uh, these folks uh, at least have convinced some of their adherents that the, the dogs are the one in charge. You know what I mean? Because, uh, in fact, they, you know, they're, they're somehow telepathically communicating with the dogs. And, and it, that noted theory got even worse off for me recently when I saw an actual processing person refer to a dog as a master, as one of the masters. So, you know. No. Um, I'm sorry, refer to him as one of the members, and I, I assume, like, well, if he's part of the membership, maybe the dogs are the masters. Maybe the dogs are, you know, because, again, these people are in some, whatever, I think whatever's thought about what goes on in these cults is tremendously far stranger than that, because, like, you know, you got this do- weird dolphin activity. I mean, that's that's what's done publicly, right? I mean, Lord knows what else was going on to, or to what extent was going on with some of these dolphins or to some of these dogs within this these group of cultists, you know, these process cultists. Now, if, if let's say like it's just you know devil's or whatever, if uh, Lily was process, it would, like wouldn't you assume? I'm just assuming if by looking at seeing what they're into today, if they were into animal stuff back then, you would think his research, I'm sure, got to them as well. 
Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because I, I mean, I, I'm just saying, I, I think, I think that isn't like a far thing to think about. Right. I mean, no. I think we could no, all assume absolutely. That. <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, on the map, that's why I included where he was living at the time, because you can see like, you know, in the Southern part of California, you know, you have like Scientology, you have the Gollum Sharp murders, you have Victor Wilde though, you know, he has a lot of leather shops there. You know, you have all this sort of adjacent activity. You've got a lot of the motorcycle stuff, particularly with the Satan slaves, not so much the Gypsy Jokers, but then like right in the middle, you have Esalon. And I mean, John C. Lilly was, you know, a high ranking Esalon member, you know, he was there all the time. That was in the newspapers. You could easily find it. Uh, for a while, that was his listed address, was at Esalon. Was he actually staying there? You know, who knows? Um, and then in the upper part is where all the Zodiac and Process and Manson and all of that. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that it speaks to what they do now with their nonprofit today. I also think that it speaks to their inner teachings that Ed had and their inner rules. So, you know, in their Masal, they have the rules for children and rules for animals, but it really is just for dogs and it specifies such. Uh, the rules for dogs and caring for dogs is not only longer, it's an older policy. Uh, and they consider kids, because in my opinion, you are a kid, you become an adult inside the process when you are 14, and then you are treated as an adult. Their rules for uh, infants is very, very bizarre. But as far as how to care for your children, they pretty much don't care. Uh, they put you to work immediately, which is also very Scientology, sort of like Sea Org, right? Uh, as far as what we know and what we're told but the stuff with animals, I mean, every single thing is so meticulous, even though like Lisa, I've shown you that photo from Process Alpha where that dog looks emaciated and terrified. So is that rules for certain Processians and their dogs, you know, versus maybe the outer Processians and their dogs, who knows, but they clearly value animals over people. Right, right, no, absolutely. And especially a particular breed nonetheless and the, that particular breed you know is was bred specifically to pay homage to the motherland of germany and so it you know and, and for that it almost kind of ties back to the whole occultism the whole nazism and what have you and then you see kind of some of these people that that bred um alsatians like um geraldine rockefeller that she kind of donated a lot to the the actual um german shepherd dog breed to, to continue the line. Um, and she pumped in a whole lot of money. And of course, all of this kind of went underground during World War II, the anti-German sentiment. They didn't want to be associated with it, but it doesn't mean that the funding stopped. Doesn't mean that, you know, all the breeding stopped. But yeah, and, and the whole, what why they picked Alsatian, the name was just to pay homage to the place that didn't fit or was kind of the go-between or the saddle between. Um, but they were German shepherds nonetheless. They just picked that name, Alsatian, to go basically underground, which to me kind of is analogous of what they're doing in their life. They've gone underground. They keep morphing. They keep changing to mm -hmm. evade detection, to, to basically just slip within the cracks themselves. So, um, but yeah, it's, that, definitely that picture does ring a lot of alarm bells with the emaciation of the dog as well, especially the tail being down and then how the ears are pointed back. There's a lot of fear in that dog and not so much like running away fear, but unpredictability. You can tell that his body stance indicates a lot of unpredictability in what's happening at that moment. Mm. Which is scary. As far as that? that question on the screen, I have no idea, by the way. Okay. I, I've right, never okay. heard of smart approaches to marijuana. I'm happy to look into it eventually. Uh, I'm going to be dying in Ed Sanders' files most likely. Uh, but if I think of it, I will absolutely come back to it. Yeah, you know, I was even when I was looking at that question, I mean, I don't know if it's like really worth the money considering other things that they're into, but if you have some sort of cult that's like has a cultist or occultism is involved, there's going to be botanists somewhere probably. You know, and they probably could grow, like, some of the better stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, I mean, who's, who's to say that they're actually going to get into growing drugs, especially weed? Was well, that a drug rehab program, I presume? Is that, is that what that is? What? Oh, no, I think the that person was asking if... Uh, smart approaches uh, to marijuana? 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. My mm, bad. I don't know. I, yeah. I was thinking that may be some sort of drug rehab type of situation. Yeah, you know what? That's a. Now I'm wondering how that question is worded. Yeah. And to that, to that ends, I don't have any specific information, but I think drug rehabs are deeply ingrained in the quote unquote, the literal process of the process, the actual process of the process. And, uh, that was one thing I wanted to discuss today. I'm glad it's a good point. And, uh, uh, if I may, if I may ex explain to how, what I'm talking about here is the process of the process is the process operates through a number of criminal enterprises, I think over time and their pattern of activity has shown this. And I think, um, the, Infamous author Thomas Pinchon captured this, these operations in the story that he that he wrote. Contemporary to the Manson situation in Los Angeles, where he lived, was a story and called named Inherent Vice. And then I think the underlying narrative of that entire storyline, Pinchon's telling, it's actually was done in a movie by Paul Thomas Anderson about ten years ago. I think the narrative of that is Pinchon's describing the process. Because deeply ingrained in this whole narrative of, this, of the story is the Manson family, the Manson narrative, the cold activities, countless references in the book, numerous references in the movie. But part of the things that he's showing is that is the story revolves around a private detective who's involved in investigating a lot of these criminal enterprises that, that the process or a process like Colt in the movie is involved in. They don't call it the process in the movie, but I'm saying, like, it's my assertion that Penchon, that's what Penchon was describing was the process. And a big part of that is the drug smuggling. This PI gets, he, you know, he gets involved in investigating these different criminal enterprises throughout the, throughout the story. And it, it involves drug smuggling and then involves the drug rehab to, in order to get folks off the drugs. So it's, it's a cycle. So they're putting them on the drugs. This is the, the, the cycle in which the, the criminal enterprises consist of is, is the process the literal process, right? The literal process in which the process cult is is orchestrating these crimes. So they put them on the drugs, they traffic in the drugs, then they then they put them on the drug rehab, and then once they kick the drug, you know, kick the drugs, and they put them back on the drug, you know, the drugs again in the future. So it's it's a repeating cycle, it's a repeating process, and in that also, which is shown in throughout uh, Inherent Vice, and that I've long suspected was a component of the process and only recently been confirmed through files in the Ed Sanders archive that, that Dana located was uh, the involvement of dentists. So in the, in the story inherent vice, a big component of the, uh, of the criminal enterprise of this cult that, 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 that uh, this PI is interacting with, you know, the various, uh, you know, again, they don't call it the process cold in the film or the book, but it is, in my opinion, the process in a big component of that is these dentists. So they get them, they're getting folks hooked on the heroin and, you know, and uh, the heroin's destroying, you know, the, the teeth and whatnot of a lot of the, the heroin addicts because it destroys the bone structure for one of the first things to go is the teeth. So, then, you know, the, the part of the process is they get them on the drugs, they give them the drug rehab, then they get them, then they give them new teeth to the dentist and whatnot, and then, and then repeat, repeat the, you know, that process to people. So these, I think these, uh, these, chemi these, these criminal enterprises are, you know, I think that's exactly, Penchon knew what was going on when he wrote this book. And again, he lived, I think the book's roughly 30 years old, but he lived in LA during all these activities and presumably was, had some, some firsthand experiences, at least viewing some of these activities. But, you know, that, that storyline, I think encapsulates what the process is because it has the mafia, you know, we talked about the mafia already and the, the outlaw biker gangs, they're, they're both depicted as components of this cult in Inherent Vice. The Esalon Institute, they have their own Esalon Institute version in this storyline as well, um, in Inherent Vice. So, again, they're, the, all the things we're, we're kind of talking about, you can see these components of this cult within this narrative in the storyline of Inherent Vice, and I think that was done intentionally by, by the author, Thomas Penchon, and, and then put into a film format just uh, about 10 years ago by Paul Thomas Anderson. And also, it also includes uh, how uh, the LAPD is involved in a lot of these kind of activities. And, you know, there's a you know, detective played by Josh Brolin. So it's not, you know, you have the, the mafia, the biker gangs, the cultists, the, you know, they, they're all involved in the drug trafficking, right? They got the dentists and the rehab as part of that, part of their little enterprise as well. But then, you know, it's also depicted as how are these people getting away with it? Well, they have top cover from folks like the LAPD detectives. And there's real life examples of that from Manson. All the way through OJ, you have basically the same set of robbery homicide detectives working all of those cases. 
the four on the floor murders and in, in, in Wonderland murders in Laurel Canyon. That's the John Holmes stuff. Um, they're they're involved in that they, again the Manson stuff. Uh, one of those detectives arrested Polanski for the rape charge, right? You know, then, then that's when Polanski fled the country. So you know, it's the same set of the de- detectives that are involved in in this storyline. You have it. There is a detective who's clearly been involved in setting folks up for for crimes along these, these lines as well. He's also in, in specifically orchestrating a lot of the activities in in that in the inherent vice you know storyline, the plot line you know, in, in, uh, to his own ends, you know, he's, he's orchestrating a lot of the stuff, but nonetheless, he represents a character, I think, in that, that is actually based in reality along amongst a number of these LAPD homi- robbery homicide detectives that have, uh, been involved in covering up some of these cult stuff. Again, from the Manson crime through OJ, you have the, the same set of detectives that are involved in basically bringing uh, seemingly no justice to these matters because, you know, even with folks like, uh, relative to the process and Roy Raiden, the Roy Raiden murder, you know, I don't know that that, that whole narrative has really been kind of uh, run through as far as public knowledge of what really went on there because, you know, the, uh, in my opinion, a lot of it got buried by these same groups. You had folks like Ira Reiner, who was Charlie Manson's friend and the uh, defense attorney for one of the Manson girls. I believe it was Krenwinkel and, He's later the district attorney for Los Angeles during the Cotton Club murders of the process. So you have the process murders of the Manson. He's a defense attorney. Later, like 15 years later, he's he's the district attorney for Los Angeles. And, you know, seemingly, in my opinion, covering up these uh, processing crimes related to the Cotton Club, what's known as the Cotton Club murders. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, not only does I think, you know, and Thomas Pinchon knew what was going on back then. I think a lot of the elements of what he knew was going on have still not really come, come to the, come to the surface in, in these, in these storylines relative to the process. And, you know, it's, if, if anyone wants, if any folks on the interwebs want to, want to get a, you know, a, a, an artist, artistic depiction, a visual depiction of the process and their activities, especially relative to the Los Angeles time frame in the early seventies, I think inherent vice is definitely a great film to watch to, to represent that. And again, you got the, the gangsters, the bikers, the cultists, the drug traffickers, the Esalen Institute. I mean, all these narratives we've been discussing are all, all the kind of depicted there. You know what I was like, even thinking like if, if there really is that many, like, uh, you know, if it really does branch out to that many different types of groups of people, like kind of working together, being associated with just even in that, that sense, if that does happen, you just have so many more options too. Of like, oh, this person knows somebody like in the force, or this person knows somebody over there. It's just that even spreads open like so many more people and possibilities of connections. Well, that's a great point, and you reminded me of something I forgot. Also, is they cover the Cointel Pro aspects in the film as well, and in, in, in the book, in the film, Inherent Vice, and also I think one, possibly one of the biggest takeaways for me is the main character, which is played by Yaquin Phoenix, the PI character is played by Yaquin Phoenix in the film. He operates out of a free clinic and he goes by the name doctor or doc. So everyone calls him a doctor, which I think he represents folks like operation chaos, which, you know, were these uh, folks like, uh, you know, Lewis, Jelly and West and other, other such characters within the CIA sphere of uh, uh, Intel activities relative to these cults operating out of free clinics in like San Francisco. I think that's kind of, that's what this character depicts as well. And on that, on that tab- topic, you know, folks who wrote the book Chaos, Tom O'Neill, he's recently doing interviews, seemingly part of the process church cover-up or movement, deterring, you know, adding these new kind of revisionist narratives around the process. But he's doing that in a podcast recently with the guy who produced the music album by Skinny Puppy, The Process. So there's Rick Rubin, who's the producer for Skinny Puppy's album, The Process, who they literally, he, he invited Skinny Puppy to come live at his Malibu home to come write and record that album, apparently, as the story goes. He's interviewing Tom O'Neill and doing this whole revisionist history recently of the, of, of chaos, of, of O'Neill's book Chaos, but I think O'Neill's book Chaos is obviously a nod to the Operation Chaos, which is the CIA's kind of, you know, uh, social influence, social engineering activities, but yeah. You know, that's interesting. All these, they stayed with him. I totally. What's that? I didn't even remember that. Rick yeah. Rubin was involved. Yeah, Rick Rubin. Yeah, I mean, he, he was. You know, he's he also is responsible for, um, you know, other other cultist albums that uh, the Laurel Canyon, the modern Laurel Canyon scene. 
Was it uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Blood Sugar, Sex, and Magic, spelled oh, wow. the Crowley way? Um, that was recorded in the infamous uh, Houdini Mansion there in in uh, Moral Canyon with Rick Rubin. You know what I thought sucked too is like the process. That album, their sound drastically changed. I thought. I mean, I know at oh, that really? point, I think they had already lost a band member due to supposedly a heroin overdose. But uh, yeah, I I was a like I really was like a fan of theirs when I was younger, and I really did not care for anything from the process on. Interesting. Yep, because it just drastically. I mean, it even sounded like. My opinion, it's like the machines you were just using. I understand now you can go into a computer. It's a little bit more compact, but, like, the machines you were using sounded better. Why did you switch over to this? Like, it didn't even sound like. Oh, really? Like, yeah, just, you could tell. Like, they, like, literally probably changed equipment. Hmm. Yeah, I was yeah I thought it was an interesting interview just from the, I mean, I've never really been a fan. I don't have that kind of background with Skinny Puppy. It is oh, no, I was really, really big into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I totally forgot. About- Sorry, go ahead, and then I want to bring something up. I don't want to figure it. Go would you, what would you call it? Like, did they sell out in that album? Was it like a Hollywood kind of sellout album? Or It sounds like it wasn't. Like That's kind of how I perceived it, but it sounds like they went backwards in their in their artist, artistic talents. Yeah, and either that or it's like maybe I just never knew how much that other guy might have been important, but like... Okay. Uh, I really do feel like, like, again, like it... I don't know. I mean, some people think that that's uh, Kevin Keyes, like some of his best shit is like from then on. But I don't agree with that. But uh, and he's kind of been always the main guy making the music anyway. But I, I I don't know about sell out. But like I do know from that point on, they always like there seemed to have been kind of like some like looming financial thing. And like you know, were they even going to put out another album? Like mm-hmm. they were even supposed to put out an album called Insolvency. I don't know if they ever did, <laughs> but it never even at one point they're like, oh, we can't even put that out. I'm like. Huh. Probably because of the fucking name. Yeah, I was like, well, you jerked yourself. You know, calling it that. Yeah, (laughs) it's just like, come on. Um, But yeah, I mean, I maybe, maybe, maybe they were trying to sell out. (laughs) Sure, I mean, that's just. I mean, they could have been a failed sellout band. They went to Malibu, stayed in like a Malibu beach house. You know what I mean? Like that's that's kind of how I was. Which that was my perspective of it. Which is funny because they should even know, like Trent Reznor opened up for them uh, a few times back in the past and like there was many times where he actually got booed off stage by their fans really so I mean you couldn't even like you've already seen what like sold out industrial music you already saw the reaction from your fans but I guess uh, see that's what happened yeah they sucked but uh, one thing I did want to remember to bring up now I I don't uh, going by let me put a book in on that real quick Nick Uh as far as the what I saw was the importance of that interview is like if none of these, if all of this process discussion and that topics and you know new new uh, threads or whatever is, is irrelevant, and not important, then why are folks like the guy who produced the process album or the album it was a concept album or the theology of the process was the album? Why is that dude interviewing Tom O'Neill and doing a revisionist history of aspects of the Manson family? and aspects directly of Manson to the process and the process generally, right? So if none of this stuff was important, I wouldn't expect that to be going on. What I'm saying is because it's going on, I think is indicative of the fact that there's still this active process church cover-upper movement decades after some of the more infamous murders that the uh, cult was associated with, be it RFK, be it Son of Sam, et cetera. Decades later, there's still this active movement, which seems to go on within some very integral characters within that movement. Again, Rick Rubin being a, an important character in the Hollywood piece, in my opinion, given his you know, status as this kind of historic music producer who's been involved in a lot of this process and cult you know, music production. I think it's, it's an important takeaway there from that interview. And one more thing. Uh, so on that interview, Tom O'Neill divulges that it was Ted Gunderson who oh, yeah. turned him on to Jolly West. He had interviewed Jolly West and like it didn't go well and he didn't really get anything. But Ted Gunderson was like, no, you need to go and research his files, see what you can get from the archives in the university. A weird connection with that is in Ed's files. This has only been rumored, but there's a lot of stuff to substantiate it here. Uh, so Michael Reconciuto of The Promise Scam 
scandal. He was an informant in the hate Ashbury, specifically watching Manson and Abigail Folger. Apparently, Ted Gunderson was his point of contact for Maury Terry and Ed Sanders. So I just think that that's really weird that uh, we also have Tom O'Neill saying that he was contacted by, you know, COINTELPRO, Ted Gunderson. I think that that's very bizarre. That's all. And if I may just add a one note on that there, Dana, the uh, fellow we were talking about before and from the Sanders files being an alleged process member, that would be former Governor Jerry Brown from California, Moonbeam Brown. He actually hired Gunderson as a special investigative consultant in the years after Gunderson uh, retired from the FBI, and that's per Gunderson's biography himself. So, you know, Gunderson certainly seems to have some uh, some shady connections and some be putting himself in some interesting spots along this, you know, because, you know, that was kind of his thing once he retired from the FBI was he was the satanic cult investigator guy. You know, so that was that was kind of his number he put himself. Allegedly. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard uh, especially that name being questioned, like the authenticity yeah, of sure. that man. I have heard that a few times before you. Uh, the one, the one thing that uh, I did, I just don't want to forget. I know because of the animal thing. Um, I know with Skinny Puppy, it, they say it was not. It was more of trying to expose what was going on. That could have, that could have been the truth. But they did have an album called the Vivid Section, and they were talking about like uh, animal testing, uh, chemical testing. But uh, wow. yeah, but I mean, you know, again, the processions and Vivid Section and <laughs> fuck. <laughs> well, to your point, to your point, so, that, <laughs> to your point about that, and, and I think we kind of touched upon that, Dana, is that, you know, they're looking at dolphins and dolphins are kind of known for the communication, telepathic communication or telepathic in the vocal, and they read it off of the brain. And so you look at some of the experiments that are done with uh, German shepherds and you're looking at pituitary hypothyroidism. I'm sorry. Um, what is it when you're short? Um Hypopituitaryism, sorry, hypopituitaryism, where you have dwarfism. And so, and you see a lot of testing being done with German Shepherds because the, the way that it's set up is very homologous, which is almost identical to human. And so you see all of that type of funding going towards that. And you almost wonder, you know, what is that? And then one of the offshoots of that is the leukemia receptor, whatever being associated with that. So then now you have the cancer tie in with that funding. But one of the things I wanted to say, because you brought up Esalen and trying to, I guess, tie it back into the process. And I brought this up, I don't know, maybe the second time that we were on. And I think people have questioned this. And I, I still stick to my, my gut on this, is that you have to look at um, Alfred North Whitehead. You know, he's the mathematician. And he published a lot of books with Bertrand Russell. And with particularly the Principia Mathematica, that some of uh, the stuff that was in there by Whitehead is quoted on um, some of the, I guess, Scientology missives. So they're using Whitehead stuff, and they're they're quoting him. And then Whitehead goes on to actually put out a detailed account of auditing, which is what Scientology uses. And the reason I bring up Whitehead is because he wrote extensively with Bertrand Russell. Now, Bertrand Russell's face was on the cover of Esalen's first magazine, and they use his curriculum. So you can't say that Whitehead, Whitehead doesn't get a whole lot of credit. I think he was more important than Russell, just you know, based on some of the stuff, some of his teachings. But you can't, you can't say that Whitehead is not in there. And I know that he put out a theory of process philosophy, and you're like, well, the word process is in there, so of course it's tied to the process. But what if it is? What if it is? And that is why. And and you have brought this out a lot in that I do believe that the process church is the scientific arm of Scientology. But I don't know. I agree. I think that they're the muscle. I also think that they're like uh, the street gang. And I also think that they are absolutely... Uh, you know, the lobbying arm, I think that they have been much more successful at lobbying than Scientology. I mean, some people could argue that, you know, as far as their success in Clearwater and Hollywood, but 
they've become a lot more unfavorable, you know, in the court of public opinion. I don't think that that's the case with best friends. I think that that has had quite a, the opposite trajectory. True. So I think that, you know, uh, best friends, absolutely the lobbying scientific, cause they're getting a lot of laws passed for a lot of this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and they make a ton of money. So, and people don't really bat an eye. Mm-mm. Not the way that they word it. No, yeah. absolutely not. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to, uh, add JJ? Uh, I'll just add my, my last, that last slide I sent her my one slide. Yes. I'll, I'll right. close my, uh, my statements on that is, uh, we, we recently did some smiley face killers, uh, discussions and I was going to include that in th- that conversation, but decided to hold off to this one for this comparison. And, uh, this to the left of the, the image here, I think is, uh, is an important thing to consider but based on the conversation we've had today. This is an image from William Ramsey's first Smiley Face Killers documentary. So I convers- probably the first podcast that he and I had done on Smiley Face Killers was uh, the first week this thing was released, you know, seven, seven or so years ago. So this is something, this is a thread that he sent me on down that, down that, uh, down this uh, rabbit hole when, uh, after I saw that, that documentary. And that was the relation of the Smiley Face with this electronic dance music scene. And that, that image you see there is uh, from... A band we've already discussed today, or at least a musician, Trent Reznor and his Nine Inch Nails, along with uh, accompanied by members of uh, Genesis Peorge and his his associate Christofferson, who made this this EP, uh, you know, a, a shorter album in this EP album, Broken from Nine Inch Nails, which that that image on the left there with the smiley face is the is is from the music video, and uh, that and that that. Uh, album was in part produced at the Tate the uh, Tate uh, house uh, murder house there in uh, Benedict Canyon so and Trent Reznor called the studio Love Pig Studios and named after that murder because the in the Tate murders there the Tate folder you know uh, murders there at that house uh, at Cielo Drive they the the uh, word was uh, pig was in, was scrawled in blood on the wall there Reznor calls his, his uh, music studio he put in the home Love Pig Studios, and that's where that song was at least partly produced, that album where the image there from Broken. And then you look at the corresponding image, you know, the use of the smiley face amongst that community, right? So you got Reznor, he's opening up for Skinny Puppy, puppy as we discussed the process, right? You know, it's the album's recorded at a, at a, at a process-related crime scene. It's named after the, the, the process-related crime that occurred there, you know, and you look at the characters who were involved using in this video, Making this video in the, in the album, the Genesis Bjorsh and gang, whose friend and fellow bandmate Fred, we've already discussed here today, as far as being some processians. So you have that direct processian connections all over that album, right? Then you look at kind of the uh, psychosexual torture being shown in the vi- music video. So in the music video, this individual who's in this leather mask is kidnapped from the street and basically gone through the psychosexual torture, which I suspect is what goes on with the smiley face, a lot of the smiley face killer victims. And strangely enough, in the Rome location of the uh, Process Museum, which is open today, you can see there on the image, on the other image on the right there, that's uh, that's prominently displayed in their uh, in their museum today, and it looks suspiciously like, you know, the scene depicted in the in the music video. And uh, another reference of the same capacity with the same S and M scene is uh, the. Uh, uh, passage actually Dana recently covered on her uh, comparison of the ultimate evil, the versions, the more Terry ultimate evil version versus the later quote unquote, Josh Zeman's version of the, uh, who, or whoever made the editorial decisions in that version of the ultimate evil. There was an individual that was cut out altogether from that a fellow by the name of Andrew Crispo, who ran an art gallery in New York city was a uh, close friends with Roy Raiden, you know, so, you know, this is an individual as asserted by Terry in the ultimate evil was a member of the process. And again, we've discussed how the process has operated these art galleries. It's a common trade, even under our modern, the modern era of the process. So I think this Crispo character is an interesting character. And he picked up a guy from a bar, put him in a leather mask scene like this. They ended up shooting him. So it wasn't exactly like a smiley face killer, uh, you know, murder, 
but very similar in the aspect. They pick up a guy from the bar. They're doing these weird leather mask S and M stuff that you see depicted here. And then the man is later, later murdered. And that was not only that was uh, attributed to the process there in the ultimate evil. It was later completely edited out of the later versions of the ultimate evil. And I think that's extremely telling in regards to some of these activities in the current process church cover upper movement that continues today. I have, I have a question. The, and this is off, off topic, what you're saying, the actual hookup to the mouth is I'm assuming it's blowing air in or is it taking air out? And the reason I ask that <laughs> is because Could some be pumping of these, water in, right? <laughs> well, I'm thinking taking air out because some of the lungs that are autopsied are underweight. There you go. That's a good thought too. Normal, normal lung weight, just normal. Lung Could weight. also cause suffocation, right? Which is why you would have a dry drowning. These right. as a, these smiley face killer victims that are dry drownings, they don't have water in the lungs, but yet they somehow drowned or suffocated. Ooh. I think that could be a solution right there. Like yeah, like you just said, they're sucking the air out and causing them to be the lungs to be underweight and causing the lungs not to have any water in them. But yet the individual appears to have drowned or at least suffocated. I wonder if. Uh, I mean, my opinion, if that's what that mask was doing, I could see it being. Maybe something that somebody's like fucking, I mean, you're ballsy or crazy to do it. I mean, that could give you magical effects if you're looking to knock yourself out. Interesting, okay. Yeah. Uh, like, maybe yeah, I'm like even, like, wondering, like, consciousness. could some of those people that ended up in water, like, could those be, like, initiations gone wrong? I'm just toss them in the fucking water now. Certainly possible. I think, I think there's at least that one even be why there's like the SFK victims, right, Tommy Booth. There's no ties to what really happened because, like, honestly, unless you were in these things for a long time and even became close friends with some of these people, I mean, I could tell you I probably could have been in the OTO for, like, a year and nobody, if you went through my phone, you would have had no idea. Sure. I think that's a very possible scenario, and I think it has happened at least once. Tommy Booth. Tommy Booth was being recruited into this, you know, weird gang that was doing drugs, guns, and sex. Pardon me. So... Very easily could have been the process, right? And uh, Tommy Booth was an SFK victim there in uh, just outside of Philadelphia. That's wild, yeah. When when you gave that option of possibly sucking out, like I was like, oh man, yeah. that's kind of like why I say I think the Astro Argentum mask that Crowley has for the Astro Argentum has no mouthpiece on it. It's just two eyes. Because if you're starting to do all these, you know, these things when you're doing a ritual. And and doing certain breathing techniques, you could help induce like suffocation with that mask. I've taken it off because I thought I was going to pass out before I realized that was part of it. <laughs> and then and then to the point of you know how Dana has proven that you know the process has morphed into best friends, and you have the best friends kind of set up near the river there in Austin. Um, well, under the guise of another animal shelter that doesn't advertise, but when you walk in, it's clearly that they are associated, especially on the website. And then I believe you, I traced two of high-ranking ex, ex-priests or ex-high-ranking priests, I think a Temple of Set, two living in Austin currently. So right. Yeah, okay. that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there certainly does seem to be some uh, other connections to the, the, directly to the best friends, the the modern incarnation of the, the original process. Um, church, and that is through some of this process church cover upper movement. For example, I recently listened to an interview with an individual claiming to be a, a uh, re listened to an interview from the Opperman report from an individual claiming to be uh, good friends with Bill Metzer, the quote unquote Manson 2 guy from the Cotton Club murders. And, uh, you know, he, uh, that guy who claimed to be a friend and, you know, whitewashing all this stuff around Bill Metzer and his cult activities, et cetera, you know, Bill, you know, saying, Bill's a nice guy, great guy. You know, that guy who's saying these things just happens to run an animal shelter, just happens to be friends with the head of Best Friends Animal Society, and just happens to attend conferences with these people. So I don't think that that's any, by any means a coincidence. That these are the people that are involved in the cover-up movement or people involved directly with the modern incarnation of the process today with Best Friends. And apparently friends with the guy who's allegedly one of the uh, higher hitmen of this network. <sighs> uh, Lisa, did you have any uh, questions or anything after this? No? Okay. That's it, sorry. Yeah. That's why I got stuck on that mask and it's got me thinking so many just different <laughs> things. Yeah. 
It's a lot like the Zodiac mask, right? I've, I've heard that reference before, right? With just the two the two eye holes cut out. There's no mouth or anything, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, and like even like even though you know the way that the Zodiac is done, kind of like it looks like a bullseye, but it's like almost an X. I mean, that's like so Malkuth symbol. It's just like oh, Jesus Christ. Could you really get any more ritualist? If you gave him a wand, I mean, you're good to go. <laughs> Like a pentagram hanging from it's so you just know that it's symbol, just really weird. Symbol that is a very magical looking symbol to you. What this one or like uh, the, the, the zodiac? The, the zodiac, the crosshairs, the circle in the crosshair. I mean, you know, it's you know before I got into this stuff, you know, I had just thought it was an X or the crosshairs, uh, but like you know, once I had, I guess you know, I guess got into it again after the fact, after being into the shit for a while. The first image that popped into my head was like Malkuth. I was like, why? I was like, oh, you know, I've always been thinking it was that. But I'm like, once I started thinking that the Zodiac killer might have been like involved with occultism. I mean, it's quite obvious. I mean, fucking Zodiac. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, just the name, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But like when you start thinking like maybe there was really something going on, like, some, you know, serious. It's not just like the way we, we think like the story was told to us. Uh, it seemed like to me, I was just like, that's so blatant now. And especially with like the hood and me knowing the hood. I'm mm -hmm. like, geez, I'm like, I'm like, you could even like literally like, I mean, that could actually be like a ritual outfit in a sense. And that sure. meant to try to like, you know, make it sound more than it is, you know, but it could I suspect been. it is. I suspect it is some sort of ritual outfit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you hit. If you hit Earth, I mean, like, you've kind of hit Malkuth, like, you're done. You know, you're grounded, like, your attachment to the spirit world is pretty much, you know, shit. So, I mean, in some way, it's like almost like death. But so like, into, by like death back into the flesh, saying. you know, death of, the, of this world, coming into this yeah. world, you know. At least if you're, like, kind of, like, off of Malkuth, you can still get a little bit of a chance to, like, can go up. You know, that is very much like, that's the lowest of low. Hmm. I was going to say the actual, the processing symbol itself, you know, that if you were to taper it off, it looks like pyramids and it remind, and they always kind of have that spiral going, or at least I get that from Dana's little, um, what do you call them? Your little skits or whatever. The stuff you put together was amazing. But when you spin it, it looks like, you know, kind of maybe uh, the Nazi symbol or the actual spin wheel, you know, associated with consciousness. And when that that when I saw that, and then I'm looking at it now, it reminds me of the pyramidal cells in the brain that are associated with consciousness and memory, oh. memory retention, and all that other stuff. And I almost wonder if that's what they're alluding to, because I think the center part is not circular; it's actually what, like a diamond shaped or whatever. And if you were to cut it in half, it'd be two triangles. And you have the triangle again, so the up and down, whatever. Mm -hmm. That just yeah, that's a great point at right now. Looking at that right now. And then, of course, you know, with dolphins and the telepathy and then going back to the pituitary and pineal, it's all brain, all, you know, sure. all that. I think there's a lot yeah. to be said there, yeah, as far as the mm -hmm. occulted nature of some of their symbolism. Oh, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, this and Zodiac Killer, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Dana, you have anything else or are you good? Uh, no, I think okay. we'll leave it here for now. I yes. could talk yeah, all night, time. Yeah. and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, this is perfect timing. Normally around an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. Uh, thank you all for jumping on. I really had a, that was a good time, good chats. Uh, again, more stuff that I didn't know previously. Uh, very nice. interesting stuff. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, thank you, everybody, too, in the chat. <clears throat> Somebody had even said in the chat, which is like what I've been saying on the mic for the people listening and not watching, uh, the chat is a completely different experience, too, besides what's going on in the show. They said between the, the guests or the topic and between the people in the chat, it's great. So uh, there was a lot of stuff going on in the chat for sure. So uh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate that. That's what's up. Um, real quick, uh, I'll let everybody plug themselves again. Uh, Lisa, do you want to let anybody know where they can get in touch with you in case, you know, whatever? Sure. Uh, Twitter, Solis Lisa, or Instagram, Lisa Solis. Thank you very much. And uh, JJ, you're up. JJ Vance, host of Operation GCD. Nick, Lisa, thanks for the invite back. Uh, great great conversation, Dana, on the process as always. And uh, I think everyone is looking at the comments from the chat. Looks like it was a very informative uh, conversation for folks. So, yeah, glad, uh, 
glad, glad I could uh, join you all for the conversation and appreciate the invite. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And thank you again, JJ. I always appreciate it, especially during Absolutely. the day. I know that's, you know. And Dana, thank you so much for coming on. It's like I said, it's been a bit. You were due. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you again uh, shortly. But uh, let everybody know where they can find your work, please. Uh, Rotting Jewels, Instagram, YouTube, and Dana Duda on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Check out those lives for sure, too. Definitely hit a uh, notification button for that. Uh, and thank you all again for coming on. And one more last time, thank you all inside the chat. That's what's up. And that is the end of another Recalled Rejects. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later.